This is America's Roundtable. Visit us at americasrt.com. Follow us on Twitter at americasrt. You can find us on YouTube and Facebook. Like and share. This is America's Roundtable from Washington, D.C., a weekly radio program with leading voices from America and international thinkers representing the academia, business, media, think tanks, and the political arena. I am Joel and Sami, your co-host, joined by Natasha Sardoch, economist and co-founder of the International Leaders Summit. We are pleased to be joined by Dr. Steve Hanke, a professor of applied economics and co-director at the Institute of Applied Economics, Global Health, and the Study of Business Enterprise at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Dr. Hanke is a senior advisor at the Renmin University of China's International Monetary Research Institute in Beijing, a special counselor to the Center for Financial Stability in New York, a member of the National Bank of Kuwait's International Advisory Board, chaired by Sir John Major, a member of the Financial Advisory Council of the United Arab Emirates, and a contributing editor at Globe Asia magazine. In the past, Professor Hanke taught economics at the Colorado School of Mines and the University of California, Berkeley. He served as a member of the Governor's Council of Economic Advisors in Maryland from 1976 through 1977. As a senior economist on President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors in 1981 through 82, and as a senior advisor to the Joint Economic Committee of the U.S. Congress in 84 through 88, he played an important role in establishing new currency regimes in Argentina, Estonia, Bulgaria, Bosnia Herzegovina, Ecuador, Lithuania, and Montenegro. Professor Hanke has also advised the governments of many other countries, including Albania. Kazakhstan, and Yugoslavia. In 1998, he was named one of the 25 most influential people in the world by World Trade Magazine. Professor Hanke is a recipient of three honorary degrees from the countries of Ecuador, Georgia, and Turkey. Professor Hanke is a well-known currency and commodity trader. Currently, he serves as chairman of the Richmond Group Fund Company Limited, a global macro hedge fund located in Richmond, Virginia. He's also Chairman Emeritus of the Friedberg Mercantile Group in Toronto. During the 1990s, he served as President of Toronto Trust Argentina in Buenos Aires, the world's most performing emerging market mutual fund in 1995. Professor Hanke and his wife, Lillianne, reside in Baltimore and Paris. In fact, during the past few months, there has been greater interest in Iran's quest in advancing its nuclear program, and the recent speeches of Iran's president and also Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu at the United Nations. Reports suggest that with Iran fast approaching nuclear weapons capability, the European Union has imposed greater financial trade and technology sanctions aimed at Iran. And on America's Roundtable, we have talked about the economic sanctions on Iran. Some have questioned its effectiveness, while others have shown us the effects of the restrictions placed on Iran. The greater question is that if these sanctions will deliver the results the West seeks. To learn more about what is taking place in Iran, we are pleased to have Dr. Steve Hanke rejoin us on America's Roundtable from Paris, France. Thank you for joining us again, Dr. Hanke. Good to be with you, Joel and Natasha. In a recent Bloomberg report on Iran, you were quoted uh, in this story, and it states uh, that uh, the Iranian currency has increased the severity of inflation uh, that had already been pushed up by the removal of subsidies on energy and food. And it quotes you by stating, we're getting into what is technically hyperinflation with an implied inflation rate of about 70% a month. Uh, that is the quote that they uh, included in the Bloomberg report and that there are concerns that savings are being eroded and uh, leading Iranians to other assets, including gold and property. Uh, Dr. Hanke, could you kindly elaborate on your findings when carefully reviewing Iran's current realities on the ground? Yes, well, uh, what you quoted from Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg accurately uh, reported on what I had told them. Uh, Hyperinflation technically occurs uh, when the prices increase by over 50% in, in one month. And uh, as you reported, or Bloomberg reported, a 70% number uh, puts them over that threshold. 
Now, that's kind of a provisional estimate. It, it will have to last and be sustained for a, about a 30-day period before I'd want to put it on my so-called hyperinflation chart that uh, is, is a chart that contains all the hyperinflations that have ever existed in, in the world's history, which uh, we've got uh, 57 countries that are listed in that in that particular table. What happens once the currency starts collapsing and what has happened in, in Iran is, is a case in which you've had a, a kind of a slow erosion of the currency uh, and you can detect that by looking at the official exchange rate versus the exchange rate in the black market. The exchange rate in the black market started diverging in the middle of uh, the summer of 2010 from the official rate, and it's continued to diverge. And then in September and October, there have been some uh, bouts of kind of panic selling of the Iranian real, uh, it, it kind of akin to a bank run, basically. Everyone wants to uh, unload all the reals that they have and, and try to obtain, in particular, dollars. And when they do that, of course, the exchange rate drops very suddenly and diverges a great deal from the official exchange rate. And, and from the changes in the exchange rate, one can calculate what the implied inflation rate uh, is. And, and that's where the 70% per month number that we uh, were talking about earlier came from. It was a calculation based on really what our free market prices, we call it the black market, it's not the official market for exchange, the black market, but it's a, it's a free market price, an objective indicator of value. And, and once we look at changes in those black market exchange rates, we can make some calculations and, and come up with the implied inflation rate. So that's that's where we're at. They're, they're in, uh, in, in a lot of trouble with regard to their exchange rate. So in, in one sense, you mentioned sanctions, and, and many people say, well, uh, you know, it's obvious sanctions are taking their toll. And that is true, but that's just, uh, shall we say, on the one hand. And on the other hand, one has to keep in context the, the fact that sanctions uh, have a very bad historical record. They're usually counterproductive, and they, they, they help the people that you're trying to impose the sanctions on uh, more, more than hurting them. And, and there, uh, there are many cases. The most obvious one would be like a Cuba, for example. Cuba's had sanctions uh, ever since the communists came to power being imposed on them in one form or another, but the communists are still in power. Uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Hanke, in your most recent piece uh, in Globe Asia, uh, which is titled Iran Down But Not Out, uh, it was interesting to note that you placed a World Bank's Doing Business Ranking uh, which shows a number of the countries in Northern Africa and the Middle East. It showed Saudi Arabia for the year 2012 at number 12. Uh, a number of other countries, including uh, United Arab Emirates and Qatar and so forth, uh, certainly uh, under the 50, uh, within the 50 uh, ranking nations. But it also communicates that uh, Iran is at 144. Uh, so the ease of doing business in Iran is certainly severely hampered by a number of the challenges that uh, Iran is facing today. And uh, could you share with us your uh, review of Iran uh, in respect to the World Bank's uh, doing business report and, and what we can um, learn from what is taking place in Iran at this time? Well, I, yes, uh, Joel. I actually had that uh, review of the rankings uh, of the 183 countries, uh, the relevant ones that might be comparable to uh, Iran, and then I calculated something called what I call a misery index, which is, wow. which is just the inflation rate plus uh, bank lending rates plus the uh, unemployment rate minus the annual percent change in per capita GDP. And you come up, with, you, you sum all those things up, and you get a misery index. And you find that for Iran, it's very elevated. Uh, if you go back starting in 1991, which I did in the 
in the particular column you're referring to, uh, you have very elevated levels for the misery index, uh, ranging between a, a low of about 30, and and until the recent uh, in, inflation pickup, uh, up to about 60. And to give you an idea of of how bad that is, even in the Arab Spring in Egypt, the the peak of the misery index in Egypt was was only a, a little over 30, about 35. So this elevated level in Iran is kind of an endemic problem, indicating uh, you know fundamentally a, a socialist state, a lot of intervention price subsidies, price controls, uh, g- government mandates and regulations of all sorts. And, and then if we go back before 1979, that's when the, the revolution occurred, you end up, and most people don't realize, that the Shah had become very enamored with, with the Soviet Union and, and central planning. And and they, he'd he'd made a complete mess out of Iran, and and of course that's one reason there was uh, agitation, and and a setup for the revolution in 1979. He he'd given the peasants, for example, lands, and of course that that didn't work out, <laughs> and uh, he, they when they'd received these these some of these royal lands, and and then he decided he'd go the Soviet way, and and they formed collectives. And uh, this was only five years after he'd given 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 the land to them in the first place. So you had you had that, and you had little planned cities and five year plans, and and you name it, and and mega projects, kind of delusional <laughs> projects. So all of these things kept the misery index very high in Iran going into 1979. Now, I, if we look at this kind of contemporary history since '91, very high very, very high rates relative to in, anyone in the region. And, and now, of course, the misery index has is, is, is just skyrocketed uh, once the hyperinflation started. And uh, so that's, that's the picture, a, a picture of a, a, a state and economy that do, doesn't run very well. It's a little like Venezuela. It, it, it runs, but it, it just floats on a sea of oil. So as long as they can sell oil, it, it, they, they kind of keep everything propped up and running in a half-baked way. Certainly. And for our uh, listeners, we would certainly encourage them to, uh, uh, to read this very uh, compelling article, which appeared in Globe Asia in the October 2012 issue. And they can certainly do that by going to the Cato Institute website at cato.org. And uh, under Steve Hanke, Dr. Steve Hanke, there's a list of excellent resources and materials uh, whereby Dr. Steve Hanke uh, explains in, in greater depth and clarity about the concerns of hyperinflation and some of the issues that are connected to Iran. Would you think now, at this point, and you know, looking at your uh, research for Iran, are sanctions working? And could we expect improvement in bringing Ahmadinejad to the table prior to any attempt of military uh, strikes or any similar very tense uh, situation in the Middle East? As standalone elements in a policy, sanctions are usually counterproductive. And the reason they're counterproductive is that the people who are targeted with the sanctions, the, the citizens of countries targeted with sanctions, eventually start pointing the finger at those who are imposing the sanctions, and they tend to rally around the uh, establishment in the country that's being targeted. So, I, and, and there are all kinds of collateral damages associated with sanctions. For example, now you, you've got one, one of the U.S. allies, Dubai, is, is being uh, hurt significantly by the sanctions simply because the, their trade has been reduced. They're one of the big trading partners of, of Iran. So it's disrupted the trade coming out of Dubai. Uh, also, you have all kinds of other unintended consequences and costs, and that associated with the with the international banking system. There, there are lots of costs, regulatory costs, and uh, uh, regulations that have to be followed by the banks. 
and 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 some of the banks have inadvertently uh, stepped over the line and done things they shouldn't have done, and they're they're paying big fines as a result of it. So the 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 only real winner in sanctions are the are the ones who are the bureaucrats who are monitoring the sanctions and making the rules up and so forth. The, the history is, is just not good, including Yugoslavia. I mean, Yugoslavia, the interesting part about Yugoslavia, by the way, uh, in January of 1994, when Yugoslavia's monthly inflation rate hit a peak, which was the third highest ever recorded in, in world history, the, the rate was 313 million percent in one month. Now, remember, the estimate in, in Iran they're hyperinflating, but only at 70 percent. Yugoslavia is 313 million percent. The the daily inflation rate in Yugoslavia was about 65 percent at that point in time. Now now that's that's almost the same as the monthly rate in uh, that I have estimated for Iran. So the the hyperinflation was you know orders of magnitude greater in Yugoslavia. Of course, that was in 1994. That was that was before the uh, so, uh, the uh, Dayton Peace Settlement and uh, and, the, and the end of the uh, hostilities in, in Bosnia Herzegovina. Right. Uh, let Let us go back to the U.S. Uh, at this point. Um, the Fed pushed short-term interest rates to near zero in late 2008 and has said it is likely to keep them uh, at that level almost until mid 2015. Uh, we we see last month there's a, a stronger confidence numbers, uh, unemployment uh, has fallen, uh, home sales are rising, and we also saw that uh, uh, the retail sales uh, have have improved. Uh, what are your thoughts about going forward? Should we expect higher inflation levels? What are your thoughts about it? Uh, I, no, I don't anticipate at least in the in the intermediate uh, term. Uh, elevated inflation levels in the U U.S. because the, the broad money supply is still very depressed and it's very depressed not not because the Federal Reserve has a loose monetary policy. It has a very loose monetary, a mega loose monetary policy, but that state money being produced by the Federal Reserve only accounts for about 15% of the total money supply. 85% is, is accounted for by the banking system and bank money and the, the regulations, what we these new financial regulations that have come out of the Dodd-Frank uh, financial legislation, as well as other regulations coming out of the Basel uh, Bank for International Settlements in Basel, have in effect put a tight monetary policy in place as it affects bank money and bank money accounts for as I say about 85 percent of the total so the the long and the short of it we we have overall a loose fed policy a loose state money mm -hmm. a tight bank money policy if you add them both together given their relative weights you, you end up with a tight monetary policy and tight regime, and, and uh, I think inflation is simply not in the cards under that kind of setup. And we we, ha we have a credit crunch right now in the United States. It's very hard to get credit. Indeed, that's for sure. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hackey, for joining us on America's Roundtable. Uh, we appreciate your taking time from your schedule uh, as you're in Paris, France, and we look forward to continuing our discussion on some of these very important economic and monetary issues uh, that we cover here on America's Roundtable. Thank, thank you. you very much indeed, sir. Thank you, Dr. Well, Hanke. Thank you. Good, good to be with you, Joel and Natasha. This is America's Roundtable. Visit us at americasrt.com. Follow us on Twitter at America's RT. You can find us on YouTube and Facebook. Like and share.